OK. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this concept of synthetic consciousness. Um, and so, David, you've been working and, and writing for a long time about this concept of paradise engineering. Um, and so I think it'd be helpful to kick off a conversation. You know, what do you mean by paradise engineering, and what are some of the core ideas behind that project? Yes, back in 1995, I wrote this online manifesto called The Hedonistic Imperative. And in spite of its rather debauched title, The Hedonistic Imperative is a plea to use biotechnology to phase out suffering throughout the living world and create a new, more civilized signaling system, life based entirely on gradients of genetically programmed well being. Um, and there's this concept of the hedonic treadmill, which is really important. Uh, there was an Ipsos poll in The Economist about 10 years ago, and the Ipsos poll, international poll, just asked people around the world straightforwardly whether they were happy, sad, very happy, very sad. Top of the list for very happy was Indonesia, followed by India, followed by Mexico which is extremely counterintuitive because all of those societies, as we know, have profound problems. And if we are ethically serious about fixing the problem of suffering, we're going to need to tackle our genetic source code to recalibrate the hedonic treadmill. And one of the beauties of biotechnology, germline editing, somatic gene therapy, is that it's going to be possible to recalibrate your hedonic set point, recalibrate your pain threshold. And as a transhumanist, I believe in creating a civilization based entirely on gradients of bliss. And bringing this round uh, to this conference uh, must have been about 10 years ago. I recall uh, interacting with a a young student, Olaf, who got in contact with me because I wrote The Good Drug Guide. Um, because a lot of people, they hear genetic engineering and they think, well, it's not going to be relevant to, to my lifetime. And so I wrote A Good Drug Guide. Um, and yes, uh, then flash forward another whew, how many years it was, and suddenly I read Olaf you know, on the front page. Was it Fortune or Forbes? I, f <laughs> I, 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 I forget. Um, Sadly, I am just a philosopher. If you're British, you don't go around saying, hello, I'm a philosopher. But yeah, I'm a writer and a talker. Uh, and yes, I'm bowled over by what Olaf has achieved and his vision and the potential for actually making things happen and not just, not, and not just talking about it. So perhaps, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, I think that one of the core insights um, that you had way back, and the Economist poll you mentioned sort of is evidence that supports this, is that we spend so much time as a society working on um, more efficient resource distribution. And this is, in a way, the project of capitalism, right? It's figuring out um, where we should send capital in order to sort of support the growth of, of new technology or the development of the economy. Um, but the problem with that is no matter how efficiently we sort of um, reallocate resources, we're, we're effectively not making humans orders of magnitude better off than we have been in the past, um, even though we, there's been so much sort of, quote, progress. Um, it's sort of progressing towards what? And so this idea that we will never really solve the sort of hardware problem of, of consciousness through just a sort of different social um, or political kind of machinations, right, where we can make capitalism a little bit more efficient over here or elect a different political leader over there. At the end of the day, we're not tackling this sort of hardware problem of consciousness, which is that we have this um, kind of Darwinian legacy that's designed for reproduction rather than well-being um, of the person who sort of has to live inside it. Um, so one thing I want to talk about are the sort of different um, you know, engineering, in a sense, approaches um, to solving this problem. Um, so you talked a bit about genetic engineering. Um, I think the at, um, sort of designer pharmacology is something else that you mentioned. 
Um, and this, you know, we do sort of crudely today already, things like antidepressants, um, et cetera, people are, are developing. Um, there's another kind of area that I think is very interesting right now, um, which is sort of, you know, people call it neurotech. Um, and it's sort of a hardware-based approach. So there's two approaches here. Primarily, one is surgical. Um, and this is sort of Neuralink and related technologies where you can actually surgically implant something in the brain. Um, and then there's non-surgical. And so these are things like transcranial magnetic stimulation um, and related technologies. I think that there's very big research breakthroughs um, in these sort of surgical and non-surgical uh, arenas. Um, that I'm very optimistic about because the sort of designer pharmacology path, as we were just talking about uh, backstage, has been hopelessly slow. And there's been very little progress over the last 20 years. Um, so I, I'm curious what you think today for folks in this audience, uh, many of whom um, are excited at you know, building something you know, in this world, what are kind of some of the more um, kind of short-term, mid-term, long-term kind of engineering approaches to sort of solving this hardware problem? Yeah, I mean, crudely one could say three approaches to fixing the problem of suffering. Uh, Wireheading, drugs, and genetic engineering, and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, Wireheading, uh, back in 1954, Olds and Milner discovered what were then called the pleasure centers of the brain. And essentially, this has been found true for all vertebrates, every, all, all vertebrate animals it's been tested on. A rat will self-stimulate its reward centers thousands of times an hour for days on end in preference to food or sex or anything. And given that there are hundreds of millions of people in the world today victims of intractable depression, something like grim, grim subject, 800,000 odd people take their own lives each year. Why not give people access to technologies that can create this kind of well-being? The problem with wireheading and more sophisticated analogs of wireheading is that the well-being tends to be constant and unvarying. And it's not, I think, a global solution to the problem of suffering. It should be offered to victims of intractable depression, but what we really need to do is recalibrate our hedonic set points. Now, this could be done with designer drugs, and there are some inter very interesting designer drugs on the horizon, but the problem, as we know, with rewarding drugs, uh, well, I would needn't enter into the, uh, the problems of drug abuse here. But if we're serious about fixing the problem of suffering, a kind of 100-year plan to defeat suffering worldwide, I think really we need to offer all prospective parents worldwide access to pre-implantation, genetic screening, counseling, and genome editing. And even a handful of genetic tweaks, and I do mean a handful, could ensure that every child born has an extremely high hedonic set point, an extremely high pain threshold. And this would dramatically reduce the burden of suffering in the world. I mean, any serious discussion of the problem of suffering must also consider non-human animals. A, a pig, for example, is as demonstrably as sapient and as, as sentient as a toddler. And factory farming, slaughterhouses, they need to be need to be replaced with cultured meat and animal products. And the final stage of the abolitionist project on Earth, and this can sound fantastical, is free living non-human animals. Essentially, the entire biosphere is now programmable. And in principle, at any rate, it's possible to use so-called synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance and cross-species fertility regulation to reprogram nature, essentially to create a living world in which there is no experience below hedonic zero. Now, I'm aware this probably sounds fantastical, but yeah, I think we need to construct blueprints for, yeah, a, a world without pain, a world with a more civilized signaling system. And even today, 
Just as tragically, there are some people who are chronically depressed, who spend their whole life below hedonic zero. There are a handful of outliers in the other direction who essentially go through life animated by gradients of intelligent well-being. They are socially responsible. They respond well to, to noxious and rewarding stimuli, but they have a much higher hedonic set point. And this is what I think we ought to be aiming for, a civilization, so-called hypothymic civilization of life based on gradients of intelligent bliss. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why um, I, I, I sort of called this, um, maybe a bit dramatically, uh, the final technology. Because for me, there is this question of, you know, we are developing, um, you know, all of these new um, technologies, but for what, right? And if we're really not improving the core sort of human condition and what it means to be a living conscious being in this world, um, really why are we trying to become, you know, increase life extension um, and work on um, super intelligence and things like that? Um, why aren't we really working on what you might call super happiness? Um, and I do think that there are dangerous sort of local maximas that we have to avoid. Um, for example, with the neurosurgical or sort of headset-based approaches to sort of wireheading, um, there is this sort of um, potentially humanity-ending scenario, um, right, where everyone just wants to slam the button and nobody wants to um, really do anything interesting um, or really anything else, right? Um, it's, you know, there's a, a book, Infinite Jest, um, that's, that's about this concept of a movie that once you watch it, you kind of can't stop watching it. And it's sort of this, this veritable button that you'd press forever. So I do think that the ethical sort of development of a lot of technologies happening right now um, is imperative because we need to have this sort of wireheading type technology but not fall into this uh, trap of you know, the rat slamming the button. I'm, I'm hopeful that because we have um, so much self-awareness um, relative to say a rat who will literally press the button until it dies um, that we could sort of step away from it and say wait a second, um, I want to be able to press it more, so for a second I'll stop and go eat, right? <laughs> um, I suspect humans would be capable of that. Um, but I do think that developing this um, suite of technologies that I think have different timelines, um, genetic engineering um, probably being the most important one, but the one that's furthest away, and the development cycles being the longest, um, the regulatory and ethical questions being the most complicated, um, I think that um, sort of this designer uh, pharmacology being sort of in the middle, um, where I think most of the issues there are not really technological, but rather um, cultural and, and regulatory in nature. And I think that this wireheading is probably the most near term. Um, and what I've imagined is, you know, for example, with either surgical or non-surgical approaches, you know, almost like an app store, right, where open source developers could develop um, different sort of apps, you could, you could think about it that way, um, rather than just that one button. Um, and so synchronizing, you know, whatever the machine is doing to music or a film or things like that to make um, a more gradiated experience, I think could be a very promising technology that I do think um, is possible within the next decade um, based on research breakthroughs that are happening in both non-surgical and surgical approaches. Um, so I think the whole project and, and um, of this kind of paradise engineering, it, it is to me like the project um, in the long term. Um, because if all we're going to do is continue to improve um, resource allocation, um, we're not really solving this, this hardware problem and we're not really, as a species, moving towards anything meaningful. Um, we might seem like we're progressing um, but we're really just, um, we're not really fixing the human experience. Very much so. I mean, essentially, natural selection didn't design us to be happy. It wasn't optimizing for pleasure. Other things being equal, being discontented, resentful, jealous, envious, it tends to be good for people's genes, which par partially explains the state of the world today.
However, the nature of selection pressure is shortly going to change. Uh, Olaf was, men was mentioning how, yeah, wire heading. There is always going to be selection pressure against wire heading because wire heads don't want to raise baby wire heads. But when it comes to the reproductive revolution of designer babies, when prospective parents are actually choosing the genetic makeup of their kids, i.e. genome reform, the nature of selection pressure itself is going to change. Because, yeah, imagining you're choosing to have a kid, and instead of the traditional genetic crapshoot and trusting God or Mother Nature, you are choosing everything from the approximate hedonic set point to uh, hedonic range to pain thresholds of your future kid. Essentially, there is going to be very strong and intensifying selection pressure against some of our nastier genes, alleles, and allelic combinations. Um, what could go wrong? Where does one start? I mean, as soon as one says genome reform, most people think of the E word. But unless we are actually prepared to edit our genetic source code to tackle the, the biological genetic roots of suffering, then yeah, horrific uh, misery and malaise is gonna proliferate indefinitely. And so David, the main counter argument I usually encounter um, when talking about this is an argument that you know, happiness is relative, right? Mm -hmm. That the hedonic set point can't be moved, right? Because you can only experience happiness in, in relation to sadness. I'm curious what you'd say to that argument. Yeah, it's, I mean, Tragically, as we, I was mentioning earlier, there are some people who go through life almost entirely below hedonic zero. They do have contrasts in many cases. Some of their days are even worse than others. But you wouldn't tell a victim of chronic pain or depression that they can't really be in pain or depressed because they can't contrast it with happiness. And likewise, at the other end of the scale, people who have been lucky in the genetic lottery yeah, they, they, they still have contrast in their lives between days that are absolutely wonderful and bad hair days. But in, in some cases, their lows are higher than some, than some people's peak experiences. And yeah, it just, you know, to make, make this more concrete, think of the most wonderful peak experience in your life. Imagine if life could be like that all the time, only better. And this is going to be technically feasible. And so should we, as a society, be aiming for a civilization of peak experiences, not uniform bliss, but information-sensitive gradients of well-being? Or should we continue with the biological genetic status quo? And as you probably gathered, both Olaf and I think that we should be uh, <laughs> aiming for a super civilization based on gradients of bliss. Yeah, and I, I do think that to accomplish this, the first sort of barrier is cultural, in that we need to get people aligned that this is a good idea worth pursuing. Um, because I think one of the main reasons that people aren't working on these hard engineering problems across these uh, three verticals, where I think this is the most, the, the most promising way to accomplish this, um, is because people actually don't think it's a good idea, genuinely. Um, they think it's a, a dangerous idea um, or that it's somehow ethically wrong, when in fact I, I, I think they couldn't be more, it's more the opposite. Um, so, you know, my message to folks in the audience who are thinking about what to build, um, I think this is a very exciting area, and I think it's something that um, is possible to tie in with, you know, commercial... Um, sort of capitalism. Um, I don't think that this has to be a, a centrally planned from a government, nor does it have to be charitable or nonprofit organizations. Um, I think there is a way to do this it, tied in with this sort of um, system of capitalism, um, but we really need to first culturally convince people that going down this path is actually um, a good idea. And so I'm, I'm happy that you're here um, to sort of spread a bit of the message David's really the uh, godfather um, of all of these ideas um, and everything that 
you've heard of with transhumanism when it comes to um, longevity research, super intelligence. Um, you know, David is really the pioneer of all that. So I'm over, overwhelmed. No, I mean, transhumanism is a much broader movement that can be that the three supers: super longevity, super intelligence, and super happiness. And statistically, probably more transhumanists are focused on super longevity and super intelligence. My colleague Nick Bostrom, we set up the World Transhumanist Association, best known for his book on super intelligence, Aubrey de Grey, super longevity. Eventually, we can have a civilization of all three supers. But without actually re-engineering our reward circuitry, yeah, pain and suffering are going to proliferate indefinitely. And this yep. needn't be the case. Yep. Well, appreciate you uh, joining me on stage, David. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining.